Today's guest uh, is Roger Cohen, uh, who is a columnist for the New York Times and the International Herald Tribune. Uh, he has been with the New York Times for close to 20 years. Uh, first, he was a foreign correspondent and then a foreign editor. Uh, in 1994 and 1995, he was a uh, Balkan bureau chief in Zagreb and covered the war and genocide there. Uh, his expose of Serb-run Serb Bosnian concentration camps won him the Berger Human Rights Award from the Overseas uh, Press Club of America. He has written Hearts Grown Brutal, Sagas of Sar Sarajevo, which was published in 1998, and Soldiers and Slaves, American POWs Trapped by the Nazis' Final Gamble, which was published in 2005. This past June, uh, Roger Cohen was in Iran during the election and during the post-election protests, and he was there long after most journalists had left the country, and he was literally in the streets talking to protesters. And uh, he wrote a series of really extraordinary columns for the New York Times uh, almost every other day in, in early June, uh, which were quite, quite amazing. Uh, his talk today is titled A Revolution in Crisis, Iran After June 12th. Uh, please help me welcome Roja Cohen. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to be here at Northwestern. Uh, my now 91-year-old uncle, um, having fought his way um, as a South African army officer with the Allies up through Italy, and ended up in England after World War II, uh, came to Northwestern in 1947 uh, to study dentistry and became an ardent Cubs fan. Uh, I've tried ever since to convince him that Chelsea Football Club is a more interesting sporting proposition, but I've largely failed. So um, Northwestern, given my feelings for my uncle, has a, a rather special place in my heart. Um, I've... Uh, I've written and thought a lot uh, about Iran this year. Uh, this wasn't really planned, um, but every now and again, even a hardened hack like myself gets ambushed by a story. Uh, the serial voyeur hopper, hopping from one yarn to the next is undone, as in a love affair where tables get turned and becomes obsessed. That's about where I am these days with Persia. So please find in your hearts some indulgence for my affliction. Uh, my obsession is intellectual and emotional. Uh, Iran crushes people with its tragedy. It's the original heartbreak hotel. I was told in Iran of Mahdi Bazagan, the revolution's first prime minister in 1979, unable on his deathbed many years later to bear the very weight of his country's travails Bazagan, who had said after the revolution, all of you know that I am a man of democracy, consultation, toleration of other viewpoints, thus avoiding radicalism and haste, working with prudence and gradualism. Perhaps every revolution turns on its sons and daughters in the end. Disappointments, I would say, have been particularly cruel in Iran. The notion of an Islamic republic is not an oxymoron, at least not in my view, but it has been an exacting and contradictory label. The authority of a supreme leader imagined as the prophet's avatar, Ayatollah Khomeini's central revolutionary idea, has proved hard to square with the voice of the people. Iran's centennial quest for representative government, evident since the constitutional revolution of 1905, the first democratic revolution in Asia, endures. Unlike Afghanistan, Iran is a nation ready through its education levels, its civic engagement, and its culture, something which I've learned about this year, for the demands of democratic governance. Indeed, in recent weeks, with all the talk of the fraud in Afghanistan, I've been very struck in thinking about that, how different these two countries are. And while I think in Afghanistan, a very, very poor country with very low levels of education, uh, the very notion of democracy and even of fraud in an election are hard really to, uh, to articulate. 
uh, Iran, Iran is a very different proposition. So there's frustration in Iran, especially among a young population, 65% of whom are under 35. And that frustration has grown much more acute since the traumatic days after June 12. An acceptable balance between two irrepressible features of Iran, a deep Shia faith, often finding conservative expression, and the urge for modern pluralism, this urge that will not go away, will never go away, has not been achieved. Call these currents Eastern and Western, if you like. In the end, they are Persian, and as such, sui generis. When I visited Iran early this year, in January and February, for three weeks, I tried to give voice in my columns to the various facets of an ancient land and culture. Any monolithic view of Iran is wrong. Any monolithic view of Iran is wrong. <clears throat> I described the Islamic Republic as, quote, a society whose ultimate bond is fear, where, quote, disappearance into some unmarked room is always possible. I said the Islamic Republic was, quote, an unfree society with a keen, intermittently brutal apparatus of repression. At the same time, however, I argued that the Islamic Republic fell well short of totalitarianism. A totalitarian state requires, as you know, the complete subservience of the individual to the state and tolerates only one party to which all institutions are subordinated. And I attacked the caricature of Iran, which I found profoundly wrong, that caricature of it as some Nazi-like embodiment of evil made up of bearded mullahs with their fingers twitching on some putative nuclear button. I tried to get into the psychology of young Iranians, marked by the Iran-Iraq war of their youth and their parents' revolutionary disappointment, a sophisticated and cautious psychology, little inclined toward upheaval and violence. Iraq and Afghanistan, after all, are just next door, and Iranians have taken note of what's happened there, a psychology in general favoring incremental change and drawn to the West. I argued strongly for American engagement on the basis that it would bolster this generation's reformist quest after the axis of evil U.S. grandstanding that had failed. I asked even whether the existence of a 20,000-strong Jewish community in Iran, the largest in the Muslim Middle East, should be weighed against the Holocaust denial and quixotic threats to Israel of its president. In assessing, and this is a crucial question, whether pragmatism on the one hand or adventurism on the other better characterize the Islamic Republic and its opaque array of rulers. The revolution, after all, has survived 30 years, not an outcome that was inevitable in 1979, nor an outcome, I think, unrelated to a certain prudent elasticity. In short, I asked Americans to set aside tired thinking and look at Iran anew. Well, I didn't expect everyone to agree with me, of course, but nor did I expect this. Quote, Roger Cohen is a Jewish apologist for an anti-Semitic regime, and he should be reminded often that he has debased himself. Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic. Though he cannot be said to have lied on the scale of Walter Durante, the Times Moscow correspondent who was soft on Stalin, in his determination to portray Tehran in sympathetic lights and disarm those who see its drive for nuclear weapons as an existential threat to the Jewish state, as well as the West, Cohen sacrificed his credibility as a journalist. Even more, by using the helpless Jews of Iran as the linchpin of his campaign, Roger Cohen has behaved in a manner so shameful that his reputation as an apologist for those who threaten genocide will live as long as Durante's infamy. Jonathan Tobin, commentary. Quote, Cohen strikes me as one of those highly assimilated British Jews, yes, he came here and converted to being an American, who are made more than a bit nervous by Jews who have real Jewish commitments, Marty Peretz in The New Republic. Gary Rosenblatt in The Jewish Week put it this way and put it simplest, Cohen is our, quote, media enemy number one. So, I thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I thank you for having open minds. Debate is important. There was too little of it in the run-up to the Iraq war. 
When it comes to Iran and Israel, debate is often the first victim of zealotry. Many people have a lot invested in the view of Iran articulated this year by the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, a messianic, apocalyptical cult. I do not agree, despite the terrible brutality I witnessed in the aftermath of June 12. I'll try to explain why as I examine the events of June, the American-Iranian relationship, and the issue of what policy the United States and its allies should pursue now. I returned to Iran in June before the election, my third visit if you account my drive across Iran as an Afghanistan-bound hippie in 1973, but I won't dwell on that journey. A, a festive scene greeted me in Tehran. You all know about Mir Hussein Mousavi's green wave, how it broke late, unfurled across the country, spurred hopes of gradual change, led by a man of impeccable revolutionary credentials, and kindled fears among hardliners of a, quote, velvet revolution. Perhaps you know less of how, in the days before June 12, Mousavi and Ahmadinejad supporters respected each other's rallies, engaged in vigorous debate, even vitriolic debate, charges, countercharges, letters from Rasanjani, amazing stuff, uh, debate as open as anything you would see uh, in Europe or the United States. And they even observed the day of silence on June 11, when posters that were up all over town came down, as they were supposed to, and campaigning stopped, as it was supposed to stop. Again, Iran is a sophisticated nation. It's ready uh, for a, plural, a more pluralistic system. As I said earlier, the slow-forming contours of democracy have had time to take shape in Iran. But Persian traumas related above all to security and independence run deep. And on June 13, all was changed, changed utterly. Whatever the real numbers were, something was rotten in the state of Iran that morning. So there I was on Saturday, June 13, and the scene was just unbelievable, given the openness and the festive atmosphere that I've just described. I was down near the Interior Ministry on Saturday, June 13, at around 9.30 in the morning, and this woman just came to me sobbing, sobbing, and said, throw away your notebook, throw away your notebook, come and help us, come and help us. Then I ran into a man from the Interior Ministry, and he said, I can't get into the ministry. It's all shut down. These numbers are just being pulled out of nowhere. I've worked there for 30 years and showed me his interior ministry pass, said he couldn't get in. And out of the interior ministry, which was locked down, were pouring these pickup trucks full of these black clad uh, robocop riot police who were going to become a very familiar sight of the ensuing days with their shields and their large sticks, and many of them were heading down to Musabi's nearby headquarters. And I think I entered probably the Musabi headquarters at around uh, 10 a.m. Uh, that morning, and the place had already been turned upside down, papers on the floor, the whole place had been completely ransacked. And there were police vehicles going back and forth with these kind of eddying, confused crowds saying, you, you over there in the blue shirt, you, you over there in the hat, you over there, move, move, get out of there. And if you didn't move, if you didn't move immediately, they were sweeping in phalanxes on motorbikes down. Uh, Tehran is a city of wide avenues and then narrow alleys between them. And they were sweeping down these alleys, just beating people uh, right and left. And where the streets had been full of summer ease and the sweet breath of freedom, now they were full of fear and menace. People were shaken to their cause. Had it all been an illusion? Some sinister puppet master, it seemed, had suddenly decreed that the entertainment was over. And that afternoon, I was up on Valley Asa, which is the Champs-Élysées-like, broad, magnificent avenue that runs north to south uh, across Iran with flanked by these old, beautiful plane trees. And uh, the crowds were going back and forth, being beaten back by the riot police and by the plainclothes thugs known as the Basiji, who, who had also made their appearance with their shields and batons. And uh, I saw men and women uh, bloodied uh, for the first time. Um, actually, a Canadian-Iranian came up to me with blood streaming from his, from his face, and he lifted up his T-shirt 
to reveal this huge welt across his back. And I have never in, uh, alas, now a rather long journalistic career, seen such an extraordinary and almost surreal uh, change of atmosphere in a place uh, from one day to the next. The Tehran of June 11 had simply vanished. It had evaporated and it had been replaced uh, by an atmosphere that I, I can only compare to a putsch-like atmosphere. It was an atmosphere of fear. People were on the Kiviv. They didn't know where to go. Uh, they were appalled at what had happened to their votes uh, and, they didn't, and, and they were out in the streets uh, ready to protest that. Well, uh, what, is, what are we to make of all this? Uh, I think one basic point that needs to be made is this, and that's that it's the responsibility of a state holding an election to satisfy its citizens that the vote is fair, not the obligation of those citizens to prove the proceedings were fraudulent. And the Islamic Republic clearly failed in this. I mean, we can debate until the cows come home what the actual numbers were, but the Islamic Republic clearly failed to demonstrate to uh, the almost 40 million voters that these proceedings were fair and transparent. Uh, and that's why there were millions of people out in the streets almost from the first hours. A system that has the vote tally done by a group of re regime officials inside the Interior Ministry and then arbitrated if necessary, and it did prove necessary in this case because even the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei conceded that perhaps there were problems with three million of the votes by a body, the Guardian Council, that's also stuffed with loyalists is not one ready to give the final say to the people. That's the least that can be said. The experience of 1997 and Hatami's election the election of a reformist, gave many Iranians the sense that the word republic did mean something and that if they couldn't change the system, they could alter the balance within it. They could nudge it one way or another in a reformist or oppressive direction every four years. Well, the experience of 2009 shattered those notions and that is a significant internal shift within Iran. So, two days go by and on Monday, June 15, I make my way down to the broad avenue that runs between Enkelab, Revolution Square, and Azadi, Freedom Square, between revolution and freedom. It's proved a long, hard road for the Iranians. And uh, there were, um, I don't know, I mean, there were millions of people there. Uh, the mayor of Tehran, um, uh, Mr. Halibaf, who is a moderate conservative, no friend of, of, of Musavi and the reformists. Uh, from aerial photos, subsequently, he estimated the crowd at three million people. Um, maybe there were only two million, I don't know. Uh, I did manage to clamber up on an overpass that was trembling, shaking from the weight, uh, and look back toward uh, Enkelab and forward toward Azadi. And there was no end uh, to this crowd. And it's quite simply one of the most moving things and powerful things in its dignity uh, that I've ever seen because these people were saying only one word. They were saying sokut, sokut, silence, silence. And every, every time anybody's voice was raised uh, to more than something above a whisper, um, this, people would respond sokut. And this crowd essentially just moved in silence. And this silence was full of rage. It was full of dignity. Ahmadinejad, by this time, having been asked by Hamanei to make a conciliatory speech to all Iranians, had gone out. And this is a sign, I think, of all the confusion in the post-June 12 days and an indication, I think, that all this was sort of improvised as they panicked at the last moment. He'd gone out and called uh, anybody who hadn't voted for him hooligans and dust. And I asked... Uh, one young student next to me, um, uh, what he felt, and he said to me, we may be dust, but we will blind him. And I asked a young woman uh, next to me what her name was, and she said simply, my name is Iran. And there were old and young out there. Uh, there were people talking about how they'd marched in 1979, there were women who were trying to get the um, city police of Tehran, who behaved the best uh, throughout all this, 
uh, to make the V for victory sign that some were making. This was the one day when the Basij and the riot police were not really out. And uh, they were trying to get the police to, to join in, and there was some contact there. And uh, uh, you felt that Iran was, was poised. It was really uh, poised, um, and it was unclear which way it would go. And the notion that some have put out that this was the haute bourgeoisie of northern Tehran and that we correspondents who hang out in the north of Tehran had somehow been deceived uh, by the views of this small group of people, uh, deluded, uh, and had failed to understand what the mass of Iranians thought. Well, anybody who argues that was not in that crowd that day. This was an immense uh, cross-section from southern Iran, southern Tehran, western, eastern, north, from outside the city. Um, and they were united by one thing, not, I think, that they wanted to overthrow the Islamic Republic, uh, although many of them would have wanted to do that, but they wanted their votes counted. It was very simple. They wanted their votes counted, and they didn't believe they had been. Now, I don't know how many votes President Ahmadinejad got. I'm sure he got a lot, quite possibly enough for a runoff. Um, but 25 million, 20 million more than his score in the first round in 2005, that simply beggars belief. And there's this. Why celebrate such a score, if it's real, with what amounted to a push? Why must a victory by two-thirds of the vote be secured with such violence? How could his numbers remain uniform, completely uniform? The number just went like that across areas of such vast ethnic and social disparity and diversity. Is it really possible that all the first time young voters voted for him, those people whose psychology I described earlier, as that would be necessary to get to 25 million? Let's move forward three days to Thursday, June 18, now six days after the election. And the crowds gathering at Ferdowsi Square, Ferdowsi, as you know, is the epic poet hero uh, of um, Iranian literature. And the heat uh, is so ferocious that it's coming up through the soles of my feet. And we're standi standing in front of the very forbidding telecommunications ministry, which has been busy cutting off, everything had been cut off after June 12, texting, messaging, email. It was extremely difficult uh, to communicate. And um, uh, a four-year-old, bo by the way, thanks to Nokia, uh, Iran has an extremely sophisticated uh, system of monitoring of telecommunications. And they, if they wanted to cut off communication in this little uh, rectangle of people here to the left, they could do it and leave it on here on the right. And every time I moved toward a demonstration, got within four or five miles of it, uh, boom, my cell phone would go down. And uh, as a result, um, Tehran, I wrote a column about this, became what I called a city of whispers. Uh, you would arrive somewhere and they would say, tomorrow Valiasa, tomorrow Enkelab, tomorrow Azadi. And somehow the word passed and these crowds assembled in different places uh, every, every day. And a boy comes up to me there, and a four-year-old boy, and he beamed at me and he said, Ahmadi bye-bye, which was... Uh, the way of um, expressing uh, what people hoped would ha happen to the president. Um, and a woman came up to me and said that President Ahmadinejad is the man of the black halo. And there was a banner saying, we're Iranians, do not lie to us. We are Iranians, do, do not lie from us. And somebody asked me where I was from, and I said the US. And this young guy said to me, well, tell your people freedom is coming to Ferdowsi Square. And then Musavi appears. Um, Musavi appears on the back of a pickup, and his wife, Zara Ranavad, very powerful personality, who I think struck more fear probably into the Islamic Republic than, than her husband ever did. And she was at his side in her floral hijab. And the cr I was standing by chance about four feet from him. And the crowd just went crazy, come crazy. Meh Hussein, Meh Hussein, Allahu Akbar. Uh, it was completely frenzied. And, um, and I was thinking to myself, what's he going to say? You know, this is the moment. What is he going to say? And he says nothing. He, he waves, a bit like the Pope, I thought. He just, this little wave. And, and he went by. And 
I think one has to say that for all his courage in, in some respects, Mousavi in those critical days did not stand and fall with his people. Um, if he had, and, and nobody knows exactly what restrictions, and I imagine he was under something close to house arrest, that he could only go out under certain conditions, but if he had, if he'd stood there, he would presumably have been imprisoned, and I don't know what would have happened. It's another unknowable. Um, he went instead for tactics, for some kind of long haul, uh, and here we are. And we know now that freedom did not come to Fedosi Square. The uprising was crushed, crushed. But I do think several things have changed in Iran. For one thing, those protesters have transformed the image of Iran. You didn't have Madonna and U2 singing songs for Iranians before. And the mullah has ceded place to a living, breathing, questing society, the one I saw in February. That's important. In the past, the phrase bombing Iran, I think, for many people, amounted more or less to bombing an abstraction. Well, Iran is an abstraction no longer, and that's positive. And a second change is this. A lot of Iranians have moved from reluctant acquiescence to a more confrontational stance. They're angry, and their reformist hopes have been trampled. Um, they're no longer as ready as they were to say, we can change things a little. Every four years we can vote. They saw where that kind of thinking leads, and they're in a much more confrontational mode. A third is that the supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, has lost his aura. From a divine arbiter, he's moved into the trenches, and he moved there alongside Ahmadinejad and the Revolutionary Guards. The mystique of the Velayati Faki is no more. That weakens the structure of the Islamic Republic, because his post, the one that was, if you like, the critical invention of Khomeini, the, 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 the keystone of the arch of the Islamic Republic, uh, that keystone is, is looser than it was. Um, this man, remember, is, is standing in for the hidden imam. He sits at the very right hand of the prophet in the system conceived by Khomeini. He was not supposed to be down in the trenches uh, fighting with a very... A divisive politician alongside him. Uh, and as a result, his aura is gone. And the fourth is that the extent of internal division has been revealed. Uh, Iran remains an opaque society, but we know that among politicians, I mentioned Halibaf, uh, Ali Larijani is another moderate conservative who was very unhappy about what happened. In the religious establishment, where you heard a lot of dissent from Qum, the religious center, uh, and elsewhere. And I, I think we have to say that whatever else he may be, uh, President Ahmadinejad is probably uh, the most divisive figure in the 30-year history of the Islamic Republic. He's divisive not only outside Iran, he's divisive uh, within Iran. Uh, let's move forward one day. We're now a week after election, uh, Friday, June 19, and Hamenei finally speaks. And I thought before the Friday sermon, well, what's he going to do? He's probably going to try to say something conciliatory. He's got a major crisis on his hands. And there's probably going to be uh, some form of concession that something went amiss with the election. But now we have to move forward. The president is in place. We can't change that. Instead, we had an absolutely ferocious sermon, ferocious uh, down to its very last line. If the people appear on the streets, the blood will be on Musavi's hands. Foreign agents are behind this, and Zionist-run media, and British agents are even worse than Americans. That was one of the crazier things in those days, this honing in on the British, which I could understand in that the British have an embassy in Iran and it allowed pro uh, Ahmadinejad supporters to rally uh, outside it. And it maybe suggests that Iran all the time has been thinking about what to do about Obama's overtures, but there was an absolute fixation uh, on the British. Iran has that a little bit. In fact, when I saw the British ambassador in Iran in uh, January, he said that Iran was an interesting place to serve as a British diplomat because it's one of the very few places left on earth, he said, which actually believes we still have some influence. So <laughs> um, 
Hamenei went on, Iran is not Georgia, it can't be bought uh, by the likes of Soros, it's the land of human rights, of religious democracy. Uh, and in a sort of cruel uh, twist uh, to everybody who had voted uh, for Mousavi, he said that the massive turnout shows the support for our system. All these voters had proved the massive support for the system by voting in such numbers. Blood will flow if this continues. And honestly, a, a kind of a shudder ran through the city. This is the word of the leader. It's the word of God. Uh, and uh, however much that mystique has been di dispelled, as I described, uh, it is something for the Iranian people to get beyond that. And that night, that very night, the most unthinkable of cries went up from the rooftops of Tehran, Margba Khamenei death to Hamenei. And it's a measure of the distance. That is absolutely unthinkable in the first six months of this, five months of this year. Absolutely unthinkable. Uh, Margba dictador, Margba Hamenei, effectively identifying the dictator as Hamenei. And that is a measure of the taboos uh, that have fallen in Iran. That would have been utterly taboo, utterly unimaginable. And again and again that night, the cry of Mark Ba Hamenei uh, went up, and in the succeeding days, went up from the rooftops of Tehran. Well, if taboos fell, of course the regime didn't. Uh, the Revolutionary Guards, who have become more and more powerful, uh, ever greater financial interest, the Basiji, the forces of the state, they held the line. People spoke about a general strike, but it never happened. Was the country on a razor's edge? I believe it was for about a week. Was President Obama behind the curve in speaking out against the violent repression of those protesting peacefully to ensure, to claim that their votes should be counted? I think the President was. I understand uh, his reasons for being cautious, giving past history, painful history between the United States and Iran, and not wanting to be seen as meddling. But I think when women are being clubbed in the streets of Tehran, when millions of people are in the streets uh, being bloodied and battered in the name of having their votes counted, when their fundamental human rights, their right to protest peacefully, is being abused in that way, uh, the leader of the free world has to speak out. And if you look at the president's remarks, statements on Iran, he gets there in the end. The last couple of statements are pretty strong, but if the curve of the um, protests uh, went, went like that, uh, the pre President Obama was always catching up and behind it. Uh, and would pres more presidential boldness have made any difference? Um, I don't know. Um, I just don't know. I do know that I think uh, he was behind the curve, and certainly when he made the statement early on saying that Mousavi, Ahmadinejad, given the nuclear program, it's kind of much of a muchness. Uh, he misspoke. Now, the worst of the storm has passed, but this is not the Iran of June 11. It's less stable, uh, it's more inwardly consumed, and the internal power struggles right now are less visible, but they're not over. Um, Whatever else the revelation of a second enrichment plant at Qom showed us, it suggested some continuing disarray. After all, Ahmadinejad was in New York that week. He didn't mention it until he was put on the spot uh, by a letter to the IAEA from his own government uh, that had gone out several days before and by President Obama's decision to speak out. My sense is that we can expect in the coming months an erratic Iran, but one that will want to keep negotiations going uh, to see if it can offset current weakness with what would be a hugely popular breakthrough of some kind with the United States. The United States, as you know, but I feel I should reiterate this, is extremely popular with the vast majority of Iranians. I would say upward of 70% of Iranians are pro-American. And in effect, you have the opposite of what you see in much of the Middle East, where you, in many Middle Eastern countries you have a pro-American uh, autocratic government and an anti-American population. Well, in Iran, it's the opposite. So Saturday, June 20, um, now 
eight days after the election. Um, and I'm talking to a young woman, and she's debating whether she, after Hamane's sermon she should go out in the streets again. And, and she said to me, well, it's come to this. We may be killed, but, but we have no choice. And that morning I got an email from a student, and it read, I will participate in the demonstration. Maybe it will turn violent. Maybe I'll be one of the people who's going to be killed. I'm listening to all my favorite music. I even want to dance to a few songs. I always wanted to have very narrow eyebrows. Maybe I'll go to the salon. I write these random sentences for the next generation so they know we were not just emotional and under peer pressure. So they, they know we did everything we could for a better future for them. And by this time, I'm almost alone in Tehran. Um, most of the correspondents have been thrown out. Um, I, um, my press pass had been revoked along with everyone else's, but I had a somewhat um, longer visa than most people, and I happened to have arrived just two days before the election, whereas most had arrived five, six days, and most visas in Iran run initially for about a week, and then in normal circumstances, they let you renew for maybe a week, but of course, nobody got renewed. So the place just um, emptied out, and, um, and I, I was just feeling this enormous responsibility to, 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 get, to get the word out about what I was seeing. And so I read and reread these words from this student, and you can imagine how I felt. And um, that afternoon, defying Hamane, they're out there again in the tens of thousands, uh, not the millions any longer, but still. And I remember a man on crutches, and I remember a woman who'd been beaten just tumbling toward me in tears. And I tried to, to restrain her, but she wouldn't have it, and she went right back um, to face the besiege. And there was suffocating, um, uh, paralyzing uh, tear gas in, uh, everywhere. And I'd, I'd lit a cigarette, um, and I don't normally smoke, but I'd lit a cigarette. And this guy just came running up to me, blow smoke in my face, blow smoke in my face. Uh, I didn't know this, but cigarette smoke um, alleviates um, some of the um, impact of tear gas. And uh, we kind of tumbled down this back alley, one of these many alleys in Tehran. And, and you know, all the doors were thrown open. People were, uh, people wanted, everyone wanted to, to help. I mean, there was sympathy everywhere for what was going down, going on in the streets. And um, gasping uh, and staggering, frankly, I, I sort of crashed into this um, apartment building, and a woman had, had lit a small fire in, in a bowl. And uh, she held it up to my face with the smoke, and, and it helped. And there was a young man who um, uh, was lying on the, on the stairs, and he'd been very badly beaten, and he lifted his uh, pants. And, uh, and there was this, he'd been, he'd been struck with one of these batons that carry an electric charge, and, and his whole sort of leg was lacerated. And there were plumes of black smoke everywhere. There were cars going up in flames. Uh, this, these black-clad riot police were being driven back, and then, and then they would advance again. And there was the Basiji, and you were hearing this Margbar dictador everywhere. And and the, and one very striking thing was the way the women were everywhere urging the men, "Come on, get up, get up, come on, all together now, don't be afraid." And um, there was a poster of Khomeini, Khomeini uh, looming over me, and uh, I looked up at it through the smoke, and it. And it read, Islam is the religion of freedom. And that afternoon, as you know, Neda Aga Sultan was killed um, about a mile from where I was. And um, that image of blood blotching across her pale face and her eyes blanking, uh, that image went viral and global. And that's the new image of Iran. It's no longer uh, uh, the, the mullahs. And Neda Aga Sultan, I think, is a very typical Iranian. She wasn't particularly political. She was 26 years old. She was curious about the world. She doesn't want her country to be a pariah nation. Uh, she wants contact with the world, with the West. Uh, I don't know if she wanted to overturn the Islamic Republic. I severely doubt it. But she wanted her little measure of freedom, whatever measure, of, and she wanted to expand it where she could. And she got cut down. And so those were heady days, and I was exhausted by this point. I was pretty much undone, and as you can see, I still am somewhat when I think about it. 
Um, and I, I bow my head to the Iranian people. They're, um, they're a noble people with a long history. And they're a proud and a subtle people. And, and I was outraged, and I am outraged, by the brutal clampdown, the mass arrests, the show trials, the political prisoners still languishing in Evin or elsewhere, the killings still unnumbered, but certainly at least 70, and the torture of university students and uh, intellectuals. Um, the Newsweek stringer in Tehran is still in prison. Um, but, you know, outrage is not enough. Um, the issues are still there as they were back in February, and they demand a cool head. One of the coolest I know is that of Robert Gates, the Secretary of Defense. And I think he's said a couple of important things since the discovery of the Qum enrichment facility. The first was, the only way you end up not having a nuclear-capable Iran is for the Iranian government to decide their security is diminished by having those weapons. The only way you end up not having a nuclear-capable Iran is for the Iranian government to do, decide their security is diminished by having those weapons. And the second was, there is no military option, this is Gates, that does anything more than buy time. Well, look, regime survival is the alpha and omega of the Islamic Republic. Khamenei is the guardian of the revolution. And we have to remember that trauma lay behind that revolution. The U.S. involvement in the 1953 coup, the Shah as the lackey of the West, the lackey of the West. Then came U.S. support for Iraq in the long Iran-Iraq war, 1980 to 88, a million dead. World War I for these people. Uh, we're in the equivalent of Europe in 1932 or something. During the which, and we can't forget this, the Iranian people were gassed with weapons of mass destruction provided to Saddam Hussein by the West. And Iran looks west and sees nuclear-armed Israel, north to nuclear-armed Russia, east to nuclear-armed Pakistan and India. It observes that Iran was, Iraq was attacked, but North Korea was not. And the Islamic Republic clearly wants nuclear ambiguity, at least, to lock in its future. It wasn't the first country to introduce nuclear ambiguity to the Middle East. But as Gates observed, if it can be convinced that it will be more secure without that capacity and more vulnerable with it, I think maybe the equation could change. In some senses, then, it seems to me that the task of U.S. negotiators is less to threaten, and I believe sanctions would be useless, and we could go into this afterward if you want, um, than in some sense to, to reassure, uh, less to dream up new punishment than to be imaginative in conceiving of new security arrangements for the Middle East and new ways to draw Iran into the world and get over the psychosis between our two countries. Um, of course, Iran has to respond too. We need some gestures that show a minimum of good faith, quick access to the Qum facility, well, we seem to have that, temporary freeze on enrichment, who knows, maybe release of those three poor hikers who wandered across the border. Um, and I think we saw maybe something of that in Geneva last week. Um, so, getting to the end of this, Tuesday, June 22, and I was down, we're now 10 days after the election, I was down at New Far Square, and there was incense and candles and maybe 60 people sitting in a circle, mainly women, and prayers were being said for Neda, Aga Sultan. Uh, the mosque had been barred, there was an edict from the regime that anyone killed in the demonstrations, there could not be any funeral service in a mosque. And the city police actually were joining in the prayers when suddenly, as I was standing there, we were all sitting around, and by now I was pretty much alone in Tehran in terms of American uh, newspaper folk. And um, suddenly the Basid, I wasn't even bringing out a notebook. I, I'd grown a beard. I was trying to be. Somebody did ask me the directions in Farsi, which I, I took to be an encouraging sign. And they, um, they moved in, and they started just beating and dispersing people. By now I could hardly watch this kind of thing anymore. And uh, as we were leaving, somebody handed us a slip of paper, and it, 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 um, it, it was the address, of uh, Neda's address. And, and we went there, and we found her music teacher, um, Hamid Panahi, the guy with the ponytail, if you've seen the images, who was with Neda when she died. And we talked a bit in, in, in the kind of basement of this apartment building, and I asked him if she'd said anything before she died, and, and she said, 
he said, she'd said, uh, Mr. Panahi, I burnt. And that w those were her last words. And he says to me that she was like a daughter. She loved music. Um, he was distraught. And then suddenly this, um, this uh, regime official, I don't know who he was, um, but he was brusque and violent. Uh, he came out, 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 and we were all chased up. And as I kind of tumbled out of that building, a woman came running up to me and said, we don't know what to do, we don't know what to do, we don't believe in Musavi, what should we do? Well, what should America do? Um, the U.S.-Iranian relationship, as I've said, is psychotic. Uh, with no other nation on earth does the U.S. have so complete or elaborate a non-relationship. A generation and a half of State Department diplomats has not spoken to an Iranian. Nick Burns, who ran the Iran, uh, Iran uh, in the Bush administration, told me when he left office that in three years he'd never, not once, spoken to an Iranian. Diplomacy takes place between human beings. I don't know how else it takes place. Uh, we're traumatized. Um, Iran's traumatized. Uh, for 444 days, um, um, almost 30 years ago now, images of wild-eyed Iranian men holding American hostages were beamed nightly, uh, Walter Cronkite, you know, nightly into homes from San Francisco to South Dakota. And so Iran got into the American subconscious in ways that have proved insurmountable, although I think clearly with the passing of generations that trauma is easing. And in a similar way in Iran, the 1988 shooting down of an Iran air passenger plane with 290 people on board, that inhabits a deep, dark place in the Iranian psyche. Still, I do believe that significant members of the establishment in Iran believe in the possibility of a China option. That's to say that like China in 1972, and China and the United States agreed on nothing in 1972. The only thing they agreed on was to begin diplomatic relations. And look what the results of that were. There are people from Rafsanjani to Larijani. I don't know about Hamenei. I think he still leans against. But there is significant sentiment in Iran in favor of a China op Preservation of the regime, the system, but opening uh, and rapprochement with the West. Um, I don't think the nuclear issue is solvable without tackling the whole range of U.S.-Iranian problems. The nuclear program's about Iranian pride, and Iranian pride is tied up in the whole history of subservience to America and a revolution to get out from under that. So let's broaden the negotiation. Afghanistan, Iraq, where some of our interests coincide, Hezbollah, Hamas, Israel, visas, blocked Iranian assets, all the poisonous history. We've got to get it out on the table. Um, Geneva was a start. Um, Burns spoke to Jalili. Um, and uh, it's interesting that Europeans have really supplanted the United States at this point as uh, Iran's enemy number one. I think it's probably President Nicolas Sarkozy at this point. So I think that is a sign that the U.S. option is being entertained. I also think the zero option, uh, the so-called zero option, probably yeah, has to, has to be abandoned. I mean, the genie's out of the bottle. Iran, in, Iran is not going back to zero enrichment. But it might, it might, if everything else came into, into place, accept highly monitored enrichment that guards against weaponization. A 24-7 IAE presence will be needed um, if the inducements from the West can satisfy its pride. As Gates said, Iran must be made to feel more secure without nukes than with them. That's not impossible. Iran would be taking a big, big risk if it makes highly enriched uranium and builds a warhead. It does not like big risks. As Hamane said earlier this year in response to Obama's Nauru's message, we're not emotional when it comes to our important matters. We make decisions by calculation. So finally, on Thursday, June 24, almost two weeks after the election, I leave. My, my visa's expired. It's agony to go. Um, and the images from the street are almost too much for me to bear. Um, I did, I, ha I consider going into hiding and I told my, my wife that I was considering staying beyond my visa and she just said to me, uh, let me know when you've made up your mind, which was probably a pretty, pretty shrewd response. In any event, sal sanity prevailed um, and, I, and I made my way out the country. Um, 
And, you know, for all the power of Twitter and the new hybrid journalism that builds on images and impressions of citizen reporters, a void has been left by Iran's banishment, complete banishment uh, of all the foreign press. And I wrote a column on my return, um, which I said, journalism is a matter of gravity. It's more fashionable to denigrate than praise the media these days. In the 24-7 howl of partisan pontification and the scarcely less constant death knell din surrounding the press, a basic truth gets lost, that to be a journalist is to bear witness. The rest is no more than ornamentation. To bear witness means being there, and that's not free. No search engine gives you the smell of a crime, the tremor in the air, the eyes that smolder, or the cadence of a scream. No news aggregator tells of the ravaged city exhaling in the dusk, nor summons the defiant cries that rise into the night. No miracle of technology renders the lip-drying taste of fear. No algorithm captures the hush of dignity, nor evokes the adrenaline rush of courage coalescing, nor traces the fresh raw line of a welt. I confess that out of Iran, I'm bereft. I've been thinking about the responsibility of bearing witness. It can be singular still. Interconnection is not presence. As you see, uh, in conclusion, I am emotional when it comes to Iran. Forgive me for that. Perhaps it's not a bad thing. Good journalism does require the head and the heart. But don't forget the head. <laughs> I've always believed that. And perhaps because I'm emotional, I refuse to give up on the idea of better days between Iran and the United States, even if right now, after the events of June 12, the odds look long. Like Hafez, the great Iranian poet, I believe in the miracle of renewal. Hafez, who wrote, Although I'm old, you hug me tight one night, so I arise young again at dawn from your side. Thank you. And if I have a voice, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Mr. Cohen. So I was also in Iran. I'm from Iran uh, as well. And we were there visiting family, actually. So I was there during the election. And one thing that I remember from the debates between um, uh, Musavi and Ahmadinejad was that one thing that Ahmadinejad said that actually stuck with me was the fact that he brought up the point that back uh, when Khatami was the president, um, the Iranian government, the Khatami's uh, administration was uh, bending um, all sorts of ways to try to please the Americans and they actually helped the Americans in Afghanistan only to be named as part of the axis of evil just a few months later. Um, so what he said was that in, under my administration, Iran has actually become a force in the Middle East to be reckoned with. Whereas when Khatami, a reformer, was a president, that was not the case. Um, so how do you get, I think that's the dilemma that uh, Obama's administration is dealing with right now. How do you um, try to enter into any kind of negotiation with this government, the current Iranian government, without undermining all the all kinds of human rights abuses that are taking place. I mean, mm. um, yeah, you want to get involved with Iran, but how do you try to, how do you do yeah. the, both of them at the same time? Thanks. Thank you. Well, you covered a lot of ground there. Um, and there's no question that the Bush administration, in my view, made a very <clears throat> fundamental mistake in 2002, 2003, when there was some outreach um, from Iran, and Iran had been significantly cooperative at the Bonn Conference and in Afghanistan. And there was definitely something going on that was worth exploring, but instead of which uh, we got access of evil and, 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 and the rest is history. Um, I think it's true, as you said, that Iran has been a rising power over the now nine years of this century. I, I think you know the pause button on that has definitely been hit. Uh, by June 12, um, um, you know, the resonance, the revolution, um, Ahmadinejad, it was easy for Ahmadinejad to deal with Bush. Uh, he could attack the arrogant power. Um, one radical could attack another radical, and it was, uh, it was easy for him. But now with oil at 70, with, with the violence we saw, uh, with his own weakened power base within, I think, um, I think that 
arc of Iranian, it's, def it's leveled off. I mean, whether it will resume uh, rising, but it's, it's, it's level, I would say, at this point. Now, to your basic question, um, well, it's, it's extremely difficult, and it's an agonizing choice, and I've, I've agonized uh, over it. Uh, in the end, um, I think the only way to help all the young people of Iran uh, realize their dreams, and I'm talking about the 65% under 35, is to get over this psychosis, to get Iran uh, into the world. And, um, and I think there's a possibility of that. It's, not, it's, it's, it's a long shot, but it's, it's a possibility that I think merits uh, exploring. And that is why, despite what I described to you, and using my head, I hope, I am uh, in favor of trying to pursue uh, these negotiations. I don't, think, um, I don't think that the Obama administration should be silent about what has been happening. I don't know if Under Secretary Burns um, brought it up in his meeting with Jalili uh, in Geneva, but the fact that three months have gone by uh, since June without really a word from the administration about this, um, I think I think is wrong. I, I think uh, on, you know it's one thing to question the election, say it was fraudulent, whatever. I mean, clearly, if the administration went in that direction, then there there would be no chance of any talks. But I don't think um, stating that human rights have been violated um, does preclude talks. And I think I think the administration um, should do more. Um, to keep the spotlight on, 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 what, on the unconscionable things that have been going on. All that said, I think in the longer run, um, the Obama administration has done the right thing uh, by trying to um, you know, not veer too far off course, the course set as early as the campaign when Obama, who I know is personally interested in Iran, um, uh, not to veer off course and to try um, to get into negotiations. And then let's try to broaden them and let's see um, where they might lead. And ultimately, if that could possibly succeed, uh, it will be to the benefit um, of all the people who want a more open, freer Iran. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Check. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Um, my question is, do you think uh, the United States' perception of Iran, Iran is fundamentally skewed? And if so... Do I think... Sorry, could you repeat that? Do you that? think that uh, the United States' perception of Iran is fundamentally skewed? If so, uh, what would be so, sort of to blame for that? Would it be conservative messaging? Would it be Israeli's public foreign policy? Uh, and also, do you think that the last elections changed that perception at all here in the United States? Yeah, well, as I said in, in, my, in my remarks, I, I do think the perception of Iran has broadened uh, considerably in the United States, and there's a much more rounded picture. I think Americans were rubbing their eyes when they saw these millions of people out in the streets. I mean, they, and John Stewart, of course, did those shows when he was interviewing people, and, you know, these are, Iran is a highly educated society, and uh, I don't think that was on most people's radar screens. Uh, why? Because, as you mentioned, I think um, the, the, the bomb Iran, uh, Iran equals nukes, uh, Iran um, equals um, um, you know, annihilation of Israel. You know, this, this, met, this drumbeat has been um, extremely strong, and I think it, it skewed the overall picture of Iran. I'm not... Um, I mean, clearly, uh, what's going on in Iran, uh, you know, represents a threat uh, for Israel, and the world will certainly be better off uh, with an Iran uh, that does not uh, uh, get a nuclear weapon. Uh, but uh, I don't believe the way to deal with this is, is by saber-rattling. I think it's with a lot of sobriety, um, looking at the realities of the Middle East. Israel is nuclear-armed. Um, so many other countries in the region, uh, and let's let's try to deal with reality in the Middle East. And I, I think uh, I think the president is trying to do that. Uh, my own view is that any military attack on Iran 
and I'm certain that it would not come from this administration. Uh, what would be left of President Obama's outreach to the Muslim world if we're at war from the western border of Iraq uh, across the Arab world, across the Persian world, to the eastern border of Afghanistan and on into northwestern Pakistan across 2,000 miles of territory. And we're saying uh, to, the, to the Muslims of the world, we don't really have anything against you. We just happen to be at war uh, in three Muslim countries, Arab and Persian. Um, I don't think that flies. Uh, so, um, but, um, you know, would, would Israel attack Iran if convinced that Iran was close to developing a nuclear weapon? And if, in addition, the Obama administration had um, said no, um, well, you know, people will go uh, either way on that. I, my, I myself think not, but a lot of very qualified people think yes. I'm sure that, you know, there's this notion that somehow the people of Iran would, would, would cheer the bombing of their country, you know, that people who oppose the regime would... Let's just look back 30 years. What happened when Saddam Hussein saved the Iranian revolution in many respects by invading? The entire Iranian people, who are a proud people, united against the invasion. I believe that if there was an attack on Iran, uh, you would basically lock in the regime for, for decades to come, and, and Iranians would unite against... against and um, you know, Iran has many surrogates in, in Lebanon, in, in Gaza, and elsewhere, and uh, it has assets. Um, and uh, we would see a much more unstable and dangerous world if that were to occur. I think it would really leave the promise of President Obama um, uh, it, it would damage, if not, if not utterly um, you know, unravel it. Yeah. I would first like to thank you for covering this political and social history that so frequently has stepped over here. Um, but I, I study this part of the world is my specialty. And I was curious if you could speak a little bit on the impact of Iranian Americans on Iran and the protests during that time through Facebook and Twitter, et cetera. Because um, in, in my research, some people have been claiming that this action has caused actually the crackdowns to be more brutal in Iran. And I was wondering if you had witnessed something of this sort. Which action have caused the crackdowns? Um, the actions of Iranian Americans routing their messages I see, to yeah. Iranians. Right. Um, <clears throat> well, there's a huge Iranian diaspora um, in the US, um, UK, Australia, and elsewhere. And, and how many really you know, globalized Iranians, they're, all, they're everywhere. And in, the, in this country, as you know, very successful on the whole. Um, but it's been a rather, I've sensed in the last year that I've been thinking about Iran, that it's been a rather divided, dispersed, uh, even quite apolitical diaspora until, until pretty recently. So I think one important change from, from these events is that this diaspora is um, getting organized to, to some greater degree and, and, and having some impact. But it remains somewhat divided in that you have monarchists uh, and, and others and you have Musavi supporters and it's, it's, a, it's not a unified um, opposition. Um, I, I couldn't measure really, I doubt that you know, the activities of, of, the, of the Iranian Americans have been really material in, in, what's, in what's happened um, in Iran. I think it grew out of a kind of panic. Uh, I think uh, the, you know the green wave unfurled very late. There was really nothing going on, even two weeks, even th two and a half weeks before the election. It was only with the debates, um, the the emergence of Zahra Ranavad and and this message of Musavi that you know we just want to have saner, more reasonable, less erratic, less explosive relations with the world. I think that speaks to a very fundamental Iranian desire and. And the, the clampdown and everything we've seen since, and these you know, ridiculous notions that it was all organized by a couple of British agents or, or the you know, Iranian-American diaspora, it, it was indigenous. It came out of you know, what I described. So um, you know, I think these contacts 
are important, could be important going forward. And I've no doubt they're troubling to, to the Iranian security services, but I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think it's been a, a decisive factor up to now. Yeah? I had a question about the kind of post-Iranian cabinet. I had a question about your view of Ahmed Bahidi, um, kind of what you think that says about the nature of the Iranian cabinet, as well as you've done some articles and research about the um, Iranian Jewish population and kind of how they're treated. So. <laughs> Those are two, yeah. Uh, it's you know it's a it's a hardline it's a hardline cabinet. I mean, right now, uh, you know, you look at all the names and they're all, uh, you know, they just moved the former head of the Basiji to the head of intelligence, um, and he was definitely central. His name slips my mind, but he was definitely central uh, to the clampdown. And um, you know, a, a coterie um, around the Revolutionary Guard command, Basiji command. Uh, the most uh, right-wing clerics, uh, has taken a grip on the lever of power for right now, and they're going for it. They're, they're going for it. I mean, they, they, they've thrown, you know, they've thrown all the press out. They've thrown hundreds of people in jail. There have been dozens of people murdered, killed. Um, and um, I don't see any sign, you know, this is not relenting um, for now. Um, I suspect that if they feel they've gotten a handle on it um, by the end of the year, we might see the first signs of it, of, of, of some relenting. Um, the Jewish community, well, the Jewish community, you know, everyone knows, I was very struck on my first visit because it was right after Gaza and the, the uh, government was trying to whip up um, a lot of anger uh, by showing images of the Gaza attack against uh, Israel. And everyone knows where the Jewish community is in Tehran, um, and everybody knows where they are in Esfahan. And uh, meanwhile, synagogues were going up in smoke in the Paris suburbs and Caracas and Lyon and uh, lots of attacks of that kind. Was there a single um, stone thrown or you know, anything um, involving the Jewish community in Iran? No. Um, you know, I... You know, I just thought that it was worth writing about. I, uh, you know, there are red lines for everybody in Iran. Uh, Iran is a modern authoritarian state, a bit like China in this respect, where you can do what you like, you can go out and make money, you can travel, uh, just so long as you don't organize in any way against the regime, speak out against the regime, speak out against uh, the supreme leader, speak out about Israel. I mean, there are red lines, but, uh, and, and I've no doubt that for the Jews of Iran, those red lines are somewhat more stringent. But um, this community um, is, um, is living there. I've not heard of any particular incident since June 12 uh, involving the Iranian Jewish community. I, I may well have missed something, but I haven't, has anyone here? I haven't heard of any, you know, they haven't been singled out. I haven't heard any, any statements coming out of that community in particular. So. Um, you know, I just think you've got to put it in the, in the scale. I mean, there are, there's this view of the apocalyptical cult, and there's the view, which is more mine, that, in fact, behind all, all the, the rhetoric, um, this is a pretty calculating uh, government. I think they got themselves in a real mess this summer. But, I mean, take the fact that the Islamic Republic portrays itself as the leader of the Muslim world. Well, do you ever hear anything from Iran about the Muslim Chechens? Uh, do you ever hear anything from Iran about the Muslim Uyghurs of China? No, you don't, never. They never say, well, I mean, they've probably said something, but in essence, they never say anything about these two Muslim struggles. Why? Because Iran knows that uh, in order to counterbalance um, death to America every Friday at prayers. It cannot afford uh, to have Russia uh, and China as anything other than more or less de facto allies. And they tailor 
their discourse to that end. Uh, and there are many other examples of um, the pragmatism uh, uh, of, this, of this regime. Incidentally, Iran has not invaded uh, another, 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 na another country for upwards of 250 years. Yes, at the back. You touched on the nuclear issue once or twice, and I was wondering um, whether or not you thought that was more internally motivated, or uh, a lot of people draw parallels between Iran and North Korea's motivations. And similarly, North Korea recently kind of opened up a little bit more in terms of their willingness to start talks with the United States. Do you think it's a coincidence that that was then followed by uh, sort of more diplomatic efforts on Iran's North er, nuclear program? Um, and just whether or not they sort of take cues from the way you, the U.S. deals with North Korea, or if you think it's purely internally motivated, and whether or not the recent efforts by Iran uh, are sincere in terms of diplomatic efforts to sort of be more open about their current nuclear yeah. program. Um, you know, it's it's a very it's very very hard to read. Um, it, it's very opaque. We have very you know limited intelligence uh, on Iran as as we had on, on Iraq. Um, uh, a couple of things are clear to me. I mean, one is that the Iranian nuclear program within Iran has broad support. The regime has invested a lot in establishing that support. Uh, I spoke to a mullah who trained in Qom, and he told me about how nuclear experts, uh, physicists, scientists were, re were brought regularly to Qom, uh, the idea being that the mullahs then disperse from Qom to mosques throughout the country and talk about the nuclear program. And it's a bit like the nationalization of oil, Mossadegh, in, in the 1950s. I mean, this is uh, Iran's latest assertion uh, of its independence. So that is one you know, emotional factor that you have to um, bear in mind. It's also a strategic calculation. It, it was... Um, attack with weapons of mass destruction, which had a traumatic effect on the country 25 years ago. It is uh, surrounded by countries that are uh, nuclear powers. And it wants to, as I said, the Alpha and Omega is regime survival. And it wants to assure it's never again attacked with weapons of mass destruction. Now, does Iran, which of course says all its program is about civil nuclear for civil nuclear purposes, does Iran actually want to build, make the bomb itself, or just get to a kind of breakout capacity? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think it probably uh, wants to get to a kind of breakout point, a bit like Brazil uh, or Japan, and maybe in the end it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, if, uh, at least in Israeli eyes, if it's breakout capacity or a, a bomb itself. Um, I think they're feeling you know, for the reasons I described, they're feeling a little weaker than before. Um, they realize they're deeply unpopular at home. They know that talking to the United States um, is um, one way maybe to shore up some popularity. And if they could achieve any normalization, uh, that would be hugely popular uh, at home. Are they, are they acting in good faith now? Um, I think they are, you know, but I, I think they're keeping their options open and it's important to try and be as vigorous as possible in verification, get the IAEA into as many places as possible and try, you know, US intelligence currently holds that the weaponization program was stopped in 2003. That is the US position. Uh, it's not entirely shared by European intelligence agencies. Um, we need to try and get, you know, all the information um, that we can. I, I, I think, as I said, there's some real interest on the Iranian side in at least exploring uh, whether there could be some kind of a deal. I don't think there could be a deal purely on nuclear. It would have to be, it would have to be um, broader than that. Uh, you know, Warren Christopher once said of the Balkans that it was the problem from hell. Well, <laughs> You know, this this is way... I mean, it's very, very difficult. You know, Iran is a, is a constellation. It's uh, 
I mean, there are various power centers. I, you know, people say the Revolutionary Guards have taken over. I don't, I don't buy that, actually. I mean, I think they maybe are the most powerful single power grouping right now, but then you have COM, uh, you know, you have the politics. Um, and in this constellation, you know, stars kind of move around. Um, but they very rarely exit entirely. I mean, in fact, if you read a history of Iran, from the 1980s, what are the names that you're reading? You're reading Rafsanjani, Hamanei. I mean, these guys never die. You know, they just, they were young when the revolution happened and, and they're still there. So I think you always have to calculate that when it comes to the crunch, they will somehow, you know, band together rather than exit completely and, and look at what uh, Rafsanjani is doing now. So, um, so given all that, you know, trying to read exactly and, you know, there's a fatwa from uh, Hamane himself saying that, you know, that, that, that nuclear weapons are, are unacceptable. They're, they're all kinds. It's very, 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 um, it's very hard to read. But uh, I, 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 stu I do still think that a deal is possible. Um, uh, it would concede some enrichment uh, to Iran, um, but you would have very intense verification to ensure that weaponization doesn't take place. Uh, you know, whether it can be done, I don't know, but it, in, I think in theory it's feasible. Sorry, that was a rather meandering answer, but I hope there was <laughs> something in it. Yeah. This gentleman and then you, madam. Yeah. Uh, you, sir? Yeah. Iran's population is roughly half Persian, but then there's a very substantial Azeri minority, about 25 percent. Kurds are about 10 percent. Arabs, 5 percent. And I was curious, what did you see on the streets of Tehran? Was it purely Persians, or were there uh, people from all over the uh, Republic who were coming to participate in the demonstrations? Well, while what you say is true, these uh, ethnic differences are not um, instantly recognizable, of course, and there's a great deal of mixed blood in Iran. I mean, certainly there were people were coming in. One factor in the week, and my colleague Bill Keller went down to Esfahan and walked right into a huge pitch battle there. Uh, so it's certainly not true that there were no demonstrations elsewhere, but you were more exposed if you demonstrated in Tabriz or Mashhad because the crowds were smaller. So a lot of people did take buses and come to Tehran and join in the demonstrations there. Uh, I couldn't say, you know, what the, you know, as you know, uh, Hamenei himself is part Azari and is related uh, on that Azari side to Musabi. Um, so, and now there's this theory going around the, about President Ahmadinejad's Jewish family roots. I don't know if any of you have followed this. Uh, in the Daily Telegraph in, in the UK and elsewhere. He changed his name, which um, the family changed their name, but uh, I, I think it's a lot of nonsense. But there, anyway, so um, I couldn't say really, um, but my impression was this was a, a broad cross section of Iranian society. Yeah. Well, um, I think the P5 plus one, which is what this current um, form of meeting is called, involving the permanent five at the UN uh, plus Germany, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a forum to get things started. But if we're really going to get into some of the issues I described, we need a bilateral track as well. Um, and it would be important, I think, to try and get a bilateral track between the United States and Iran uh, going um, as, as, soon, as soon as possible. Um, well, we have overlapping interests to some degree in Afghanistan, um, whether it's not wanting to see the Taliban reinstated in Kabul, on drug issues, uh, a shared, in general, I would say, a shared hostility to Al Qaeda. Um, um, you know, the Iranians 
I think essentially, uh, you know, f they are they're they're ready to fight Al Qaeda. I think, and uh, in 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 Iraq, a, a shared interest in um, you know democracy continuing to function, the form of democracy there is, because that's what delivers power to the Shia majority, and that's what Iran wants in uh, Iraq. It wants a Shia majority government. Uh, neither the United States nor Iran wants the breakup of Iraq uh, because of the Kurdish issues, so we share that interest. And trade between Iran and Iraq is now large, uh, so stability is also in Iran's economic interest. Um, now, uh, on other issues, you know, we're diametrically um, uh, opposed uh, uh, at opposite ends of the spectrum on on Israel, on Hamas, uh, on Hezbollah, on how these organizations um, should be defined. You know, are they, uh, we still brand them terrorist movements. Uh, Iran and indeed many other countries would argue that there's something much more complex than that with social and political and other elements uh, to their character. On Israel, of course, what gets most attention is President Ahmadinejad's um, outrageous uh, Holocaust denial and um, suggestions that Israel should disappear from the map. If you actually look at other statements of his and you know of other Iranian leaders, from Rafsanjani on through, there are others, uh, Khamenei. Um, you know they've said words to the effect that uh, you know we will res whatever the Palestinian people. Uh, concludes with Israel, uh, you know, we will respect. Um, and so, you know, there are different ways of looking at it. I mean, you know, Israel and Iran have never fought a war. Uh, they cooperated under the Shah. Uh, they cooperated uh, in the first eight years after the revolution when Israel provided Iran with material support for the war against Iraq. Um, they're both... Um, you know, Iran is Shia in a Sunni sea. Israel is a is a Jewish state. Um, you know, I don't I don't think you know the two countries have to be mortal enemies. But um, you know, you could imagine a Malaysian type solution. You know, with respect to Iran Israel, where um, you know, basically of, of just sort of non interference, non. I mean, no, there's no diplomatic recognition of Israel by Malaysia, but they don't. You know, they don't, it's not an issue. I mean, it's just, and you know, they're, Iran and Israel, are, they're not neighbors. I mean, they're, you know, they're a thousand miles or so apart, you know. So it would be very, very, very difficult on those issues. But I think um, it's better to broach them than leave them festering. Uh, yes, and then you. And then maybe we'll wind up. Is that good? Yeah, so two more. I want uh, two questions. First, uh, I mean, what these events, uh, first of all, I'm Iranian. Second, uh, these events, if they have shown us anything, is that the government of Iran, the regime of Iran, doesn't represent the people. And the things that you say about, like, the nuclear, uh, Iran wants nuclear, you know, capabilities, stuff like that. I mean, the Iranian people really don't care about that. I mean, I, I'm not the representative of, of all the Iranian people, but what I can say is that I can say they are opposed it or they are for it, they support it, is that they don't care. Because there are a whole lot of other issues to care about that they don't really, it's, it's just a government that is pumping the people, you, you know, you should care, it's very important. Right. So the Iranian people don't care about it. That's, that's the first thing that I wanted to say and wanted to ask you. You always separate Iranian regime from Iranian people, but when, you, when it comes to nuclear issue, you say, okay, Iranians think that, Iranians think right. that, really. Right. And the second thing is that, I mean, let me give you a little bit history of the Ahmadinejad. I mean, Ahmadinejad is a liar. I mean, if I can give you some stories about it, I mean, he, he comes to the, in the <laughs> presidential debates, he comes to the TV, and he lies. For example, the inflation rate is 25 percent. He says it's 10 percent. Or two of two of his ministers, including the minister of science, have done plagiarism. And 60 percent of their, you know, well, they also they say they have degrees from 
Yeah, and, and one of them, and, and the one who, who, who we not nominated for the interior minister, he said he had a PhD from Oxford, and he didn't, the highest degree that he had was the high school diploma. So, I mean, you're, you're dealing with this kind of people. It's just interesting to me that how do you think that you can negotiate with these people? And most important than that, all of it, is that they have stolen the election. They have stolen the vote of their own people, and they're lying about it. So they, they always lie. I mean, whenever we, 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 we look at Mr. Ahmedinejad talking, 99% of what he's saying is lie. She lies. No anything to do with reality or anything like that. How, how are you optimistic that negotiation with this kind of people can give you any results if, if, you, are, if you think that Mr. Rafsanjani or people like him have any influence? If they had influence, these things wouldn't happen in Iran. That's what I'm asking. Thank you. Well, um, I, I'm not here to defend President Ahmadinejad, and uh, um, uh, to me, the fraud in the election was was clear, and I wrote it, um, and I believe it, um, and I always will believe it. Um, and I agree that the prospect of this negotiation is not particularly appetizing. Um, one would rather negotiate with somebody else, but you have to play the hand you're dealt uh, in the world. And right now, that's the hand Obama's been dealt with respect to Iran. So then the question is, do we revert to President Bush-style ostracism, axes of evil, sanction them, you know, maybe eventually bomb them? Or do we say, Swallow hard, just be open-eyed, clear-eyed about who these people are and what's happened, but uh, on balance, uh, it's better to get to the table. China, Cultural Revolution China of the early 1970s was not a pretty place, and there we were talking about millions of dead. The Soviet Union of 1934, with which we restored diplomatic relations on the eve of the Great Terror, millions dead again. I mean, the Iranian regime pales uh, by comparison with these uh, mass murders. Uh, and yet, uh, the United States took the decision in both cases to, uh, in the Soviet case after a break of uh, 18 years, and in the uh, Chinese case after a break of decades, took, took the decision, while disagreeing about everything, as I said earlier, to, uh, to talk, to restore diplomatic relations. And uh, my own position is that uh, even given the things you've just said, um, that would be in the interests of Iran, of Iranians like yourself, uh, of the United States, and of the world. Uh, what, in your opinion, would it take from each side uh, for America to completely normalize relations with Iran? And then also, what do you think is a realistic timetable for that happening? Uh, well, it would take getting all these issues um, you know, out, out on the table. I mean, the, it goes back for Iran to the 1950s and the, and the U.S. involvement in the coup that overthrew a democratically elected leader, Mr. Mossadegh, and Madeleine Albright did make a kind of partial apology for that, um, but, um, you know, it would take addressing on Iran's side of the hostage issue. Um, it would take talking about all the disagreements that we have, whether it's about, whether it's the nuclear program or uh, the State of Israel or uh, Iran's role in financing, supporting, training Hamas and Hezbollah, what those organizations are. Can we reach a commonly agreed definition of what those organizations are? Are they terrorist organizations? Are they something else? Uh, if they are something else, can you, Iran, uh, change your behavior in a way that confirms they are something else? Uh, and would Iran World well, Trade Organization, uh, bringing Iran um, into the world of global commerce, lifting of sanctions, 
return of Iran seized assets. Uh, you know, there's so many questions. Um, there have been 30 years of non-communication, so uh, it will take a lot of discussion about a lot of um, different issues and um, would have to proceed step by step. In terms of time frame, well, I think, you know, I, I mean, it can be thrown off the rails, you know, at any time by some rash act, but um, I would I would think that um, uh, within a 18-month um, time frame um, from a moment when bilateral talks began, um, something might be achievable. Thank you, everybody.